Starship, the largest rocket ever built, has taken flight for the sixth time, never failing to captivate the space community. But this time, everyone had one pressing question on their minds. Why didn't SpaceX catch the booster with Mechazilla, just like they did in Flight 5? Well, that's exactly what we'll discuss in today's episode. But before we dive in, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for the latest updates on Starship, SpaceX, and their incredible achievements. The rocket launch went off without a hitch from the very first moment. All 33 Raptor engines fired up, generating an impressive thrust of over 16 million pounds, lifting the massive vehicle off the launch pad at Starbase, Texas. The ascent phase was flawless, with the stage separation occurring precisely two minutes after liftoff. However, an unexpected twist came shortly after stage separation. SpaceX announced they would not attempt to catch the booster with the make Azilla arm as planned, surprising both space enthusiasts and the live audience at the site. So, what happened? Elon Musk has explained the situation on X, lost comms to the launch tower computer. Catch would probably still have worked, but we weren't sure, so erred on the side of caution. In their official flight summary, SpaceX added more details. Following a nominal ascent and stage separation, the booster successfully transitioned to its boost back burn to begin the return to launch site. During this phase, automated health checks of critical hardware on the launch and catch tower triggered an abort of the catch attempt. The booster then executed a pre-planned divert maneuver performing a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, it seems like many of us have been so focused on the booster that we forgot about another critical component in its recovery process, the OLIT, Orbital Launch Integration Tower. Before the flight, SpaceX made it clear how complex the criteria are for recovering the Super Heavy booster. Both the booster and the tower systems needed to be in perfect condition, with final approval coming from the flight director. Now, take a look at this. Before launch, the antenna at the top of the tower was standing tall and functioning normally. But as soon as Booster 13 left the OLED, the massive exhaust plume and intense heat appeared to damage the antenna, causing it to tilt to one side. This antenna is vital, housing critical communication, stabilization, feedback, and sensor systems. Any malfunction here could create a serious misalignment between the tower and the booster. If SpaceX had gone ahead with the catch attempt under these conditions, the risk of a catastrophic accident would have been extremely high. While SpaceX's decision to forego the booster's return to launch site RTLS landing might have dampened the excitement for some, from a technical perspective, it was an incredibly smart call. An explosion at the launch pad would cause massive delays, while the benefit of catching a single booster doesn't outweigh the risks. SpaceX currently operates with only one active launch tower, making it critical to protect this vital infrastructure. Many still believe a second launch tower at Starbase is nearly complete, but in reality, it's still under construction and months away from becoming operational, sacrificing a test vehicle that's never going to fly again, or risking millions of dollars in ground equipment damage, which could also delay the entire development program. Easy choice, isn't it? And here's the thing. For now, SpaceX still needs to secure launch licenses from the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, for every single flight and landing. This decision feels a lot like saying, we don't want the FAA delaying IFT-7, so we made the safe call to cancel. Explosions are cool, sure, but dealing with administrative headaches because we didn't catch the booster, not worth it. And let's not forget the quirky highlight of this flight, testing payload capacity with a banana. Funny, right? It is but it's also more than a joke. SpaceX used it as a practical test for paperwork and certification processes regarding payloads before sending any actual payloads on board. This means payload flights are coming soon, and it's far better to identify and fix any issues now than to get lucky a few times and end up failing when it really matters, when Starship carries something valuable. The repairs and upgrades to OLIT should be quick, paving the way for IFT-7 to mark a significant milestone in the Starship program. This upcoming flight will feature Starship V2, but it's highly likely that SpaceX will still use Booster B14, a version 1 booster, similar to previous flights. This suggests the company could recreate the epic booster catch without needing to test anything drastically new. The cautious approach SpaceX took during IFT-6 is expected to smooth the approval process for IFT-7, minimizing delays. So we might see the booster RTLS return to launch site again soon. Currently, Starbase has two launch towers. The operational one stands at 460 feet, about 140.2 meters, while the second reaches 474 feet, 144.5 meters. This 14 foot, 
4.3 meter difference. Strongly hints that SpaceX engineers are fine-tuning the design for Starship Vi-2. Looking ahead, with the Starship Vi-3 project, the full-stack launch vehicle is expected to reach an impressive height of 150 meters. The biggest challenge right now is constructing launch towers capable of supporting a system of this scale. At Starbase, SpaceX is already relying on super-heavy cranes to build the second launch tower, raising plenty of questions about how they'll construct towers for V3. One intriguing theory proposed by experts is that SpaceX might adjust the lift points on the spacecraft and booster to reduce the height requirements for the launch tower. This could help address some of the technical challenges involved in creating ultra-tall structures. In fact, Stage Zero, the launch infrastructure at Starbase, is an incredibly complex system. It's not just a tower. It integrates advanced cooling systems, fueling systems, and highly sophisticated mechanisms for lifting, lowering, and connecting the spacecraft. Would you like me to create a detailed video breaking down how it all works? Comment below. While the world keeps a close eye on the development of SpaceX's Starship program, another launch vehicle is gearing up to make its debut, Blue Origin's New Glenn. This promising rocket is inching closer to its first flight. On November 21st, Blue Origin excitedly announced, here we go, and our fully integrated launch vehicle is rolling out for its upcoming hot fire. Just about a week after integrating the two stages, not bad at all. New Glenn's maiden flight is expected to launch no earlier than late November 2024 from Launch Complex 36 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. It's almost here. Shortly after liftoff, the rocket's first stage is anticipated to return to the recovery ship Jacqueline, a process similar to how SpaceX lands its Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy boosters on drone ships. To prepare for this, Jacqueline has been stationed at Port Canaveral since September. New Glenn is expected to become Blue Origin's workhorse for the next decade. As the company's sole orbital class rocket during this phase, it carries the weighty mission of advancing both commercial and scientific space exploration. Amazon has already signed a contract with Blue Origin to launch a significant portion of its Project Kuiper satellites, a massive satellite internet constellation. This partnership has secured New Glenn a strong foothold in the commercial space ecosystem. New Glenn's maiden flight will be a pivotal moment for Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin, opening the door to one of the most lucrative and critical arenas, the U.S. National Security Satellite Launch Market. If this flight succeeds, Blue Origin will qualify to compete for National Security Space Launch NSSL, contracts worth up to $5.6 billion for fiscal years 2025 through 2029. This marks the first time in the company's history that it has been seriously considered for and has a real shot at securing Pentagon launch contracts. The military payload launch market is not just about financial gain. It's a golden opportunity to establish credibility and solidify a company's standing as a top-tier player in the space technology industry. That's why the pressure surrounding New Glenn's first flight is absolutely immense. It's not just a test flight. It's a statement of Blue Origin's readiness to compete at the highest level. But perhaps New Glenn's most exciting role lies in NASA's Artemis program. Blue Origin's lunar lander, Blue Moon, is set to deliver humanity back to the moon's south pole during the Artemis V mission. This landmark endeavor promises to kick off a new era of space exploration and human presence on the moon. It's so exciting to see another major player finally joining the space race. Guys, the next few years are going to be absolutely thrilling. Miss any key updates on this thrilling journey? Make sure to subscribe to our channel. We're committed to providing in-depth analysis and the latest news on SpaceX's every step towards conquering the cosmos.